Welcome to Paper Quest. I'm Jesse. And I'm James. And we're two friends teaming up in our ongoing quest through the Infinite Library. Each episode, we get together to discuss our latest buddy read, swap stories on our recent solo reads, and talk about the upcoming books we look forward to reading next. This is Paper Quest. <laughs> Okay, so for our main quest today, we have read Daughter of the Moon Goddess by Su Lin Tan. This is yet again, unintentionally uh, on our part, uh, a brand new author, and this is their brand new first release, correct? It is. It's um, a duology, so I at least plan to read the next one, but... um... I most certainly do as well. Um, I, well... I won't jump ahead, but I'll jump into a summary first, and then we'll talk about the characters. Um, And I'm just looking at it to make sure I pronounce these right. So, just apologize in advance. Um, We're going to read it and go for it. Hui Yi and Shang Yi were once mortal lovers. Hui Yi was a great archer who, after an extremely valiant deed, was gifted an elixir of immortality. Shang Yi's... Shang Yi is pregnant, and there is the possibility of birthing complications. So together, the two decide that she should drink the elixir of immortality instead to guarantee the baby's safety. However, the Celestial Empress believes that Shang Yi stole the elixir in greed. She is banished to the moon, where she secretly gives birth and hides her child for years, leading into where our story begins today. The daughter of the moon goddess, she oh, hold on, let me get this right, Xing Yin, slowly starts discovering her own magic abilities, which alerts the Celestial Empress to her existence. Forced to flee for her life, she leaves the moon and her mother and escapes to the Celestial Kingdom below, where she must journey on a quest to survive, grow stronger, and hopefully, one day, clear her mother's name in this epic fantasy duology that will spread across two novels, written by debut author Su Lin Tan. That was a good summary. I think I did good. That was that, good. That might have been a little lengthy, but uh, there's a lot to fit in there. It's it's a pretty, it's an easy read, but it's kind of a long read. So I think we got it all in there. Yes, it is hefty, but it's, um, I, I mean, I guess first thoughts. Okay, so the very first thing I noticed was this does not read like a novel. This reads like, because there's time jumping, not really a spoiler. They're going to get some time jumping. And it just feels like I'm reading a collection of tales or legends as opposed to a deep, like, world-building experience. Did you feel that way? Um, I didn't, but now that you're saying it, I I could see that perspective. Because they were kind of, and this this will be our no-spoiler zone, we'll let you know when we get into it, but it's kind of like... Okay, and then once upon a time, there was this monster that apparently exists, and they fought the monster. Did they win? Did they lose? Find out. Um, it's And then they would talk about how, like, and then there was a point where she was training, and then it time jumps again, and it's like, it just feels like we're hearing different chunks of her, her story down the line as it progresses. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not even sure how many years pass. It's a good number of years, though. Yes, it's definitely, like, maybe a, a whole decade. Yeah, so I just felt like the book started, she leaves the moon, we enter the Celestial Kingdom, we get this big chunk where she's she's working for this woman, and then she leads, she finds her way to the Celestial Palace, it's, it's the very beginning of the book, and then something happens there in Time Jump, and now she's doing this for her army, and then Time Jump, and now she's doing this, and then Time Jump, and I'm like, yeah, you know, there's not a lot of world building, they don't explain a bunch of little things, and it just reads like little mythology nuggets and it was cool i appreciated it yeah so i will say i think that again we've talked about this i don't know a lot of chinese mythology um Mm -hmm, but uh, like you were mentioning it definitely sounds like or, or reads like the author took a handful of fairy tales or myths and legends and merged them all together and the daughter of the moon goddess um, is kind of the the binding that holds them all together, and her tale yeah. puts them together. So it's kind of like, you know, to bring it into uh, American pop culture, it's a little bit like how, um, what's that fairy tale show? 
Um, 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 Once Upon a Time? Yes. <laughs> it's it's kind of like how Once Upon a Time brings all these people together um, that have their own separate stories. Yeah, I feel that. Um, and again, I don't, the, and- I don't know if that's true. They, this might be like one big legend that I just don't know, but it, it doesn't read that way. I did a... I did the opposite of a deep dive. I did a shallow dive <laughs> online just out of curiosity um, and just tried to look up the daughter of the moon goddess, which there's lots of stories. I forgot to Google Chinese um, moon goddess um, just to see like how accurate it was. There's a bunch of, you know, slightly different retellings of the story. I didn't particularly come across one where there was a daughter involved. So I, I think this was made up for the story, Okay, which is interesting if that's correct. So I definitely have read, um, and again, this is not a spoiler, um, there is a story of um, 12 sunbirds, and I've read a children's book to my son about that, that he picked out because, you know, cool, fiery birds on the cover. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I knew that that at least was, but none of the other myths or, or, or anything um, were ones that I could point out and say, like, oh, clearly that's the, you know, legend of so-and-so. Okay. Um, there's also a Netflix animated show in the style like Pixar or something. Or a movie, I should say. A Netflix movie. And of course, I'm just now thinking of it, so I can't think of the title. But it's also a moon goddess story. And this girl has to make her way to the moon. And it's a really cool movie. Really? Google that. I don't know the name, but I would check that out. It's pretty new. Interesting. And it's beautiful. The animation, once they get to the moon, is like so cool. It's so different. So colorful. Um, so, is it over the moon? Possibly, yeah. It looks, sounds possibly... it looks pretty. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's really cool. But, so again, in the non-spoiler territory, would you recommend this book? I would. I would recommend it to a fair amount of people. Again, I don't think it's... The friends that I have and the family that I have, there's very few I could rec- recommend this book to. But in general, I would 100% recommend this book. Agreed. I thought it was um, really interesting, um, easy to read. And so in all transparency, I like made us push back our recording because I had not read it. Um, but I easily <laughs> sat down yesterday and read like, 200 pages um ish and it wasn't it wasn't a difficult read it was enjoyable and um yeah highly recommend i i will i i did the audio which i said on our last main quest that i was likely going to do the audio because i hate not knowing how things are pronounced Mm -hmm. and with a lot of chinese names i was like i'll be stopping every two seconds to google pronunciations so i was just like nope audio book let's get through this um, and, and that was great because the names are not how I would have pronounced them in my head. Yeah. And again, world, please forgive me because I'm going to mess them up. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we recommend it. Um, we Let's talk spoilers. Uh, do you want to start with characters? you want to start with the daughter herself? or? Sure. Okay. Uh, so we have... Xing Yin, she is, uh, how old would you say she is in the beginning of the book? Seven? I don't know. So I read her as being, because they're, so they're immortals. So time doesn't really work for them in the way it works for us. Um, and that, yeah. that kind of goes back to the, the jumping or time jumping that you mentioned. Um, I read her as being like 20. Oh, I imagined her as a little kid for sure the way she was acting i'm not that she was acting bad or childish i just thought she was like a little kid and she didn't understand why she saw these silvery dots which was her magic trying to poke through no but that's interesting you could be right so i read her as older because um she had talked about how she was um an expert in different instruments and she had um you know lived a long time and been alone a long time just with her parent or her mother and her her mother's attendant um and she i don't know it for for whatever reason i read her as probably about 20 um and by the end of the book i would say she was about 30 
Maybe maybe in the time span on the moon there was a time jump? I don't know. I could have sworn she was a little kid at some point, but I also read this like two or three weeks ago, so it might not all... I will say in advance, there's probably things already slipping in my mind. <laughs> don't um, worry, I read it what, yesterday. What that? She's young. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will say, though, she does talk about memories. So there was, mm-hmm. you know, they talked about um, how she went and asked her mother about, like, where their, her father is, or she asked this thing... Um, and they talked about moon festivals and stuff. Um, so I don't know. She just came off as an adult, but a very sheltered, lonely adult. I guess by the time she leaves the moon, she would have to be because then she's immediately working. Yeah. I mean, not that they couldn't work under like the age of 18. I'm sure all ages are working in this. So I got a little thrown. I wanted to mention this at the beginning, but I got a little thrown by some of the world building. And again, this could be me being stupid or something. I understood that there's the mortal realm, Mm -hmm. the mortal realm and the celestial realm, and there's the moon and there's the sun. So she leaves the moon, and I was under the impression that she was leaving the moon for the mortal realm, which is a place she always wanted to see and only heard about in stories. But I guess she landed in the celestial realm, or is the mortal and celestial realm, like, you know, on top of each other, and there's just, you know, like, like in the style of parallel universes? The moon is in between them. So at... Oh, I don't think I understood that. Yeah, it was a little confusing, but at the end of the book, um, her and her she talks about how her and her mother stand in um, silence on their balcony, and her mother looks down at the earth, and she looks up at the celestial kingdom. So the celestial kingdom is basically like heaven above the sky. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. I I thought she was falling to earth, but then everyone was still like magical and stuff, and I was like, oh, I'm totally blinking out on what they mean (laughs) yeah so i think the reason that um in that section it her their goal is to get her to safety um to the family of her mother's attendant um, but they have to pass through like celestial airspace basically (laughs) on a cloud (laughs) and so (laughs) i like that um you know they they have to like kind of go undetected and obviously that doesn't happen so yeah the plan goes awry and she leaves behind the assistant girl yeah, yeah. that's one name i did not write down so i, I forget the the attendant but it's okay yeah. um so one thing i did so i didn't make notes i did take a couple screenshots um and one thing i noted for whatever reason um with her time being with her mother there was a line where her mother tells her you'll never grow if you only do what you're good at the most difficult things are often the most worthwhile. And Mm -hmm. um, that definitely set the tone for me for the book because she does a lot of hard things. Yes, this is definitely a book about growth and doing new things for sure. So she falls off this cloud. She doesn't know if her nanny, basically her mother's attendant, is dead or alive. Um, She knows she's possibly being hunted And she literally just gets approached by some servant who's like, oh, hey, you looking for a job? And she's like, I guess. Um, She's read a lot of books about about other places, but she has no actual skills. So she can't, you know, she can't mend. She can't um, really do. She can like play instruments and make tea. (laughs) And that's kind of it. And um, and even sometimes the tea doesn't go right. <laughs> yeah. And so somehow she, like, just happens to um, work in this house for a high-powered lady and... The Gold Lotus Mansion? Yeah. The Gold Lotus Palace? Yeah. Something like that. They all had great names, by the way. Yeah. And um, that's, that's, kind of, that's where I really started to feel like the, oh, like, collection of myths, like... She fell to earth. She, she 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 got a job. Like it was just going one thing after another. It's not like she wandered, um, wandered around, did things. Just like boom, immediate this, immediate that, immediate that. So it kind of felt like I was getting the the cliff notes of of like the full story. Yeah. So one thing that um, starts there in that getting a job and goes throughout the book is whenever someone asks her like where her family is, um, she basically says that they're not here. Um, or something kind of. Uh, uh, she lies without lying. Yeah, something that's you know she works. She yeah walks around the truth. Um, how did you feel about her 
kind of being quote unquote honorable. I feel like that was a big part of her identity. It is a huge part of our identity, so much so that I am very angry with a late a late decision she makes at the end of the book Ooh. where I was like, mm, come on, just for one second, let, let this happen. I'm intrigued. I mean, I can jump to it if you want. I mean, we're in full spoilers. Yeah, well, tell me, what, what was this decision? So... I think she takes I, honor is so important and I appreciate the fact that she did what she did but I also wanted to strangle her <laughs> it's when she finally um, quote unquote poisoned put to sleep um, Captain Winshaw I believe that's how you say that and yeah Winshaw is the captain's name and can we just call him it, the it captain like Winsy. yeah that, that works okay. yeah um, but Captain Captain Winshaw you know, we we learned the twist of the book, yeah. and he's he's bad. He's a demon, um, and they're all in their king. They're all in his kingdom, and she knocks him out with um, a plant in his drink, mm-hmm. and then Captain Winshaw's brother, the the king or whatever you want to call it in this world, he's a prince, um, comes in and is like, "You, you did my job for me. You know what? You're free to go. This was great." He goes to like pull his sword or his dagger out to kill his brother. After everything Winshaw has done to um, Xing Yin, and then she's like, "Well, that's not very honorable to kill him when he's defenseless." And I'm like, "Let the dude die. She loves he's him. You guys for years. She still loves him. They just broke up like that day. But at that point, she was like, "I, I can't believe how I ever loved him. I could never because he she has to trick him into pretending she still loves him to c- continue staying on his good side." And that's when she's, like, faking it and trying to find the right plant to poison him with. And, like, she's done with him. And I get that this, like, there were feelings a hot yeah. second ago. But at this point, after playing the game for a while and after knowing you've been betrayed for years of your life and she's still like, well, he needs to be able to fight for himself. You can't just kill him while he's asleep. And I'm like, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Let it happen. I don't know. But no, she wouldn't. I'm. It would solve her problems it would solve the brother's problems even though the brother is bad i'm just like girl i can't just let him die i i understand why that choice was made i think she definitely has a hero's journey like i don't i don't think the author wanted us to see her making a dishonorable decision i don't think that's the point no you know yeah i understand what you're saying yeah. for sure but it's not her it's not her character <laughs> this is why I'm not an author. <laughs> um, so let's talk about some princes because we've got quite a we've got two of them actually. Leeway and actually oh we have gosh, three of I them. I forgot to write. There's down. three of them. There's uh, well, the captain that you just mentioned, who is Winshaw, a yep. demon prince. Prince. Um, there is yep. her main prince. Leeway. Leeway. And then there is um, a prince of the Eastern Sea. Forgot to write the name down. That's okay. I'm prepared. <laughs> That's okay. He, <laughs> he, he's the least of all of them, so it's okay. He is. Um, so let's talk about Li Wei. Um, first of all, I don't know how someone as perfect and amazing and kind as him comes from his parents. His parents are, I mean, especially... The Empress is just the worst. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they both are really ridiculous. So when we met him, you know, at first it was like, oh, he's just some guy. And then it's, and then like you learn, wait a second, she's talking to the prince. And the prince is like, yeah, I don't like telling people, you know, you came off as cool. You can talk to me like a normal person. I don't feel like you have to hold anything back from me. And, you know, there's no secrets between us. Of course, she has to hold the secret of she's the daughter of the moon goddess. Yeah. Rightfully so. They fight about that at the end, which is very annoying because I think she did the right thing. But yes, great character and um, very much... He, he's one of those book characters that always comes off as like the one that's wise, the one that's kind, the one that's going to help you throughout your journey sort of thing, especially in the early chapters. Yeah, so she she is joined to him as his companion. She um, kind of gets herself added to this competition to... Um, find him a companion for school because he's alone all the time and they're like yeah he needs a buddy um 
And even though she's just a servant, uh, you know, she gets herself in the competition and he basically helps her win because she treated him normally. I love so. So he kind of messes with the Empress and I love any time they they piss off the Empress because I'm like, I don't even know your full character, but I know I don't like you. And when you're seething and angry, I'm clapping my hands. And I love how he's like, oh, this tea is good. But inside he's like, this tea is garbage. And the Empress is like, you're lying. Let me see that. And he goes to pass it. And he makes it seem like he dropped it on an accident. Oh, no, it broke. Now you can't taste it. Like, I just love the way he messes with people. It's so funny. Yeah, he's definitely very intelligent. Um, but he's also, you know, he's skilled in the arts as any any good prince would be. He can handle himself with a sword and fight and um is trained in all of those ancient arts um you know calligraphy and music and all of those things Mm -hmm. um and she's lucky enough to train beside him and again they're immortal so they have some you know unique um like they have a conversation about one of the professors or tutors or whatever um who has basically allowed himself to age but he could be like 1500 years old or something and he has some lines so they talk about lines a lot like oh that person has you know not wrinkles but like some forehead lines or something which i always thought was really (laughs) interesting i actually and i like how um well this is going off topic but i just like how they describe the celestial kingdom and all the clouds and like the the brilliant like steps leading up to like the main kingdom and everything and everything about the the royalties world the, around them is really beautiful it's just too bad that the royalty sucks so um she and the prince spend a lot of time together um they you know she she is also his attendant so she'll bring him food or she'll help him pick out his clothes or whatever um and obviously romantic feelings arise for both of them and she definitely doesn't realize it as quickly i think as he did um i think i agree with that yeah um so they have a market that shows up every five years and they go to it and um he buys these two like glass ornaments i guess that you wear Mm -hmm. um they both wear them on their belt loop and if one of them is in danger it'll change color very much like a remember all in harry potter that's kind (laughs) of what i was picturing like a mini version um so if you know it's like a remember all life alert situation yeah (laughs) (laughs) so if if the prince is about to die then hers will turn red and if she's about to die his will turn red um and we it's like this very sweet moment of like a gift for a friend, even though like clearly he's crushing on her and mm-hmm. um, they come back around like they just are wearing them all the time and we don't really talk about them. And then they'll like show back up um, later in the story, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, I mean, there's part I, I, I actually almost legit forgot about those things. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then at that same market, um, she buys him a shell she she plays a tune um or I, I in my head it's a shell um but she basically records a song into this thing and gives that to him for his birthday um and he can listen to her flute music whenever he wants and apparently she's like mm-hmm. the best ever yeah she's the best because like there might be better ones especially in the competition like everyone is really good at music um, but she knows, she doesn't just play music. She knows how to put like her emotion in her, in her happiness or her misery. Like she can play her emotions. Yeah. Like she's really good at making it meaningful when she plays. And like when she plays the the sad music, you can like feel the sorrow and the unhappiness and stuff like that. Yep. And, um, as his companion, she realizes that she, like her father is an excellent archer. Mm -hmm. Um, and she will take after that yep and then she also learns how to use her magic and she learns um like the tutors will say like oh you're very powerful but you need to learn how to meditate and you need to learn how to like 
chill out basically and not be so like <laughs> amped up all the time. Um, but I feel like she spends a lot of the first part of the book in like anxious survival mode of like just trying to understand everything going around on around her and not misstep. She's <laughs> yes, yeah, she's trying to learn and be careful. I mean, because she's a lot of the times, you know, she's working directly for the Empress and Emperor's army and those are the two people that know she exists they just don't know what she looks like mm -hmm. so keeping that a secret on top of everything else she has to do this close to royalty and this close to the army that she's a part of uh for as long as she has to might stress you the f out yeah <laughs> um and so she um finds out that the prince is betrothed which like duh all like i don't know Princess Elizabeth the first, like Queen Elizabeth the first, who's betrothed at like two years old. So, yeah. Well, in this case, the <laughs> wedding didn't, or the um, proposal didn't come up until after they had met, yeah. and then like, like conveniently the day before, he was gonna like reveal to her his parents that he wanted her hand in marriage, or at least wanted to date or whatever. Um, it's like, but wait, before you speak, we have to tell you something, and it's like this is the person you're going to marry over here. And he's like, dang it. I was just going to tell them about the person that I wanted. <laughs> yeah. But like, he should have known. Like he, he definitely should have. I think he did. And probably did. He did know. Yeah. Um, but that breaks them up and she takes an offer from their, the, um, the general, the army general to, um, be actually, she makes a deal. He's like, Hey, come join the army. What else are you going to do? Um, once, once the prince is married and she's, you know, she's like, I'm not going to join, but like, I'll come on your missions. She was like, I want autonomy to make my own decisions about my own life. You know, I'm the best. That's the only way I'm coming. Um, and the reason she wanted to do that is she wanted to take all the most dangerous missions so she could win the gold lion talisman, which grants the owner of that talisman one um favor favor from, yeah from the yeah. emperor himself and that's so coveted and so rare like some of the oldest living celestials who are immortal have only seen it given out like a handful of times yes yeah. um so she becomes an archer under the captain yep captain winshaw so we've met the captain a couple times at this point he was at the ceremony where um she found out about the betrothal between the prince and his princess, basically. Um, and he, like, they're, they're uh, complementary beings to one another. I don't, I don't have a better way of saying it. They're, like, not friends, but they have this understanding immediately. Um, mm -hmm. Her and the captain and the captain and the prince immediately don't like each other. No surprise there. Yeah. Um, I really liked the captain. I I still really do, even given the ending. Yes, I still really do. He, what's what's really well done on the author's part, uh, Sue Lantan, she, she writes the captain to be smart and clever and knows just the right thing to say or, you know, do this, don't do that. But all of that while being technically good advice and sound advice is also disguising his secrets and when it, they reveal like oh yeah thinking back when he told me that one thing now i know why he said that yep. like it's all cleverly written so that it's both smart and also disguising his true self yeah and he's he comes off as a very closed off character um and mm -hmm. they'll be like yeah like he doesn't have friends he doesn't like like anyone he doesn't smile and the fact that they're you know friendly you know gets all the tongues wagging everyone's like oh they must be sleeping together they must be lovers whatever um but they weren't they were just well matched and she was just interested in taking on the biggest baddest scariest battles and because he was the top um captain in the army those were his missions yeah and, and she'll take on legendary even even for her day and age she's taking on these legendary creatures they're like well no one's ever been able to do that and then she's the first one to do it 
um, like the uh, what was it a dragon or serpent? Yeah. You know, with the, eye, the you gotta shoot the eyes. Um, so she grows up fast, um, and she learns fast, and she starts um, wrecking. Like I think there was another scene with mer people, yes. right? Yeah, the mer people. Um, the whole middle of the book, like the beginning and the end, have a lot of like continuity. They are one thing after another. But the middle of the book is where it really starts dividing up into like periods of she she slayed this, she did that, she found that. Like that's where it really starts feeling like the mythology section of the book. Yes. So yeah, she has a, a handful of battles that are very much showing her abilities, building her relationship with the captain and um kind of yeah going through these tales Mm -hmm. and the book kind of throws new plot points at you immediately like towards the end she's given the quest of okay um you must get oh shoot the dragon uh, dragon pearls the dragon pearls um and you're like okay well this is like the quest for the dragon pearls. This is going to be a long thing. And it happens very fast. She gets one and it's like, man, there's just one plot point after another. It just keeps going. Yeah. So she, um, before that, she goes on a quest to save the prince's betrothed. And yes. the prince, it, it was actually a trap for the prince. So then she ends up saving both of them. And that on top of all her other battles gets her the golden lion talisman. Um, and she, you know, bows deeply, prostrate, puts her head to the floor. Um, they talk about the like jade tile or whatever all the time. Um, and she open bears the, her truth of her, her mother is the moon goddess and her father is this, um, like myth, mythological level archer, like the best archer of all time. Legendary archer. Yeah. yeah, Archer. Um, and the emperor and empress are pissed and they're like <sighs> we should lock you up we should you know put you and your mother on a farther planet like what what can we do to you guys cuz you're clearly horrible people and um the prince is like <laughs> no 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 she saved my life she could have died she didn't need to do that um let's make a deal basically and the king's like F- or the emperor is like fine go get these four dragon pearls and I'll let you and your mother go and I won't worry about it anymore. Um, what he doesn't say is mm. the dragon pearls are the magic essence um, of the dragon and that lets you control them. Yes. So yeah, she goes on this big and, thing um, and is like, can I just have them? <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's a very important note that she would not have gotten the pearls because she promised them that she wouldn't do harm to the dragons, or like wouldn't mess with them. Yeah. Like she just needs this for a very specific reason. But the one thing she says differently is that she will also bring them back, and they're not used to hearing something like that. Yeah, she. So, like they're gonna, re- you're gonna return the gifts. Like <laughs> again, very honorable. Um, and that's when a lot of things just go to hell. <laughs> Literally. Mm-hmm. We were talking about the demon realm. Mm-hmm. Um, so she. Yeah, we we spend a little time. Yeah, there. so she's, um, you know, grabbed these pearls and put them in her pouch, I guess. Um, and she's suddenly on a cloud and being ferreted away, and she falls into like darkness and wakes up chained with magic chains that take away her powers in a tower very like Rapunzel situation and her her <laughs> her captor is the is captain um the captain her captain that she's in love with Winshaw yes and that she's literally just said like a couple days before like yes I will go to your home with you let's retire basically from the military I love you um and he is not who he says he was very similar to her And I actually will say I was offended by how quickly she went from loving him to hating him because she did the same freaking thing. 
Yeah, the difference is she's not doing anything evil. She's just. But to him, it's not. Got a secret mom. But to him, it's not evil because that's he's saving his people. Yeah, well, that gets into a whole other, you know, topic of. <laughs> of um. Uh, words are hard. <laughs> That's just a whole different discussion. Whole different rabbit hole. Um, of morality and who deserves what. And yeah. Yeah. So he does. Because the demons. He, the demons get a bad rap too. I mean, they are also doing evil things, I guess. Yeah. But they get a bad rap too, the way they were named all those years ago and stuff. Well, and also he is. He has his own selfish reasons of wanting to get out from under this abusive brother who's older than him and wants to be the leader eventually of the demon people. But she's she's got her own selfish reasons too so it val it was so quick yeah. her like no you're the worst person ever i hate you i never want to talk to you or look at you again like i want to kill you where you stand of like girl you just did the same thing kinda so yeah and to that same effect when um along that same line of revealing who you are <laughs> to people um when leeway uh, when Li Wei finds out about yeah. um, Xing Yin, he's also kind of offended. Like, you know, we share everything. Why would you think I would, you know, release this secret to the world? And she's like, well, you may certainly not have, but it could have also accidentally slipped out. And the book literally ends with him like, okay, we're acquaintances again, but we're not in love. We're kind of at this distant, like you lied to me, but you lied to me. Well, I had a good reason. I couldn't tell you because your parents are literally, literally the ones looking for me. And they leave off in like an acquaintance position. Well, and also at the end of the book. like there's people with them all the time. Like, yes, she's in his, mm -hmm. you know, courtyard or in his room setting up his books and stuff. But like there's servants everywhere. And I just, I felt like Lee Wei was harsh because Yes, she was hiding this fact, but it doesn't change who she is. Right. She's still the same person. She just had to keep this one little thing. And I thought when she revealed that fact, or when Lee Wei would find out, I thought he'd be understanding. But it did not go that way. Yeah. Um, so just to close the loop, we did mention a third prince whose name we don't know. Um, but there's a third prince of the Eastern Sea, and that is where the dragons originated. And he becomes a key player when... Um, when she decides to return the essence of the dragons to the dragons and just take the shell of the pearl back to the emperor, which is really another trick. Yeah. Really <laughs> tricksy on her part because she's not that like conniving. Um, so I was a little bit proud of like, yeah, that's what you should yeah. do. I mean, <laughs> her thought was, okay, well the emperor told me, a half truth. Yeah. So I'm gonna tell him a half truth. Like he didn't tell me these pearls had this specific thing going on. So I'm not gonna tell him my specific thing going on. Like we've both tricked each other. Deal with it. You can't be mad because you you did the same thing to me. Yeah, which is very childish, actually. Um, now that I'm thinking <laughs> about it. Um, but I did really enjoy the scene of her returning the essence to um mm -hmm. to the dragons. I don't know. There's something. Uh, there was um, 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 Priory of the Orange Tree that we also talked about in a previous episode. Yes. Um, there was some serious dragon situations happening there. And there's something about just the dragons. Like, I need a dragon story, like, from the dragon's point of view. Because they're epic. And in this viewpoint, this telling of them, um, they were, like, the peacemakers um, and they didn't, they just wanted their freedom. They just were like, I don't know, like wanting to hang out and keep people happy. And they tried to help the mortals and tried to help the celestials. And um, the emperor locked them up for not doing what he said or not, you know, not obeying. And yeah, uh, we, we treated them like, I mean, slaves. they were, they were slaves, yeah. I'm sure. Like, <laughs> um, And so, yeah, when they got their essence back, it was a very happy moment. And she gave half of her immortal life force to do that and i was like oh this emperor is going to lose it <laughs> yeah he was he was pissed what's smart though is that she made sure like it was in front of an audience she 
they find out what she did and the pearls are empty and they're like those are fake pearls no they're not fake i just gave them their freedom <laughs> and he gets angry but there's an entire audience in front of i don't know where they were the royal chambers or some audience hall yeah and they saw him getting angry but they were like hey didn't she do the thing you asked like you can't get angry right like you're the emperor <laughs> well and really the un- unsung hero in all of this is the general because both times, so before he gave her the task to go get the pearls, and after she returns the empty pearls, he's there with the army going, you know, hey, sir, you actually said that. So um, also the entire army that could just rebel and kill you right now, they're like right behind me and waiting, and they want to thank her, and they all bow to her, and she bows to them. Very Mulan. <laughs> um, you know that end yeah. scene where she's on the steps? Um and yeah, he's always just kind of like lurking. He's like, he's, he's the one that gets her in the army. He's the one that teaches her to use the bow. Um, he's, oh, he's this steady being that's always there where everyone else is chaotic. <laughs> and he's just like, yeah, I, I see that. You know, he's like, I see that you want to go do big things. But have you thought about joining the military? (laughs) You need a backup plan, little girl. And she's like, huh. You know, he's the recruiter. (laughs) Yep. And she's at her lowest point where nothing else works and is like her only option. Yeah. So, so, yeah, she, you know, she saves she saves everybody. She saved the dragons, the army, um, both princes, even though or all three, really. Um and gets to go back to her mom so not exactly realistic (laughs) Mm, (laughs) Um, but definitely an epic story i was glad it ended well i was glad mom got to see her daughter after so long i did cry a little fantastic reunion she gets to share her entire life story so far to um her mom Mm -hmm. and then i what i kind of wanted to ask you or maybe just generally talk about is the book ends and it's like a complete novel yeah. like there's not really any lingering th- um plot lines other than they're just like you know there will always be war in the future but otherwise that was like oh the book closed like pretty cleanly like i don't know what a sequel would be about it's not like it was a massive cliffhanger or anything yeah i definitely felt that way too i'm wondering if the author didn't realize that she was going to be given the opportunity to write a second book. Um, I appreciate that it was a clean cut because I hate waiting forever for something to come out. Um, I think I wrote it down. Hold on. Book two of the duel. Okay. So book two is called heart of the sun warrior and it comes out this November. Okay. Um, so not too long, definitely adding it to the list. Um, (laughs) <laughs> what what my thought is is all the players are still alive right like pretty much. dragons are alive all three princes are alive demons are yeah, alive Shaw didn't die in the end right nothing happened he with didn't him. die his brother didn't die as far as i know um and the only lingering plot other than the fact that these people are still alive is like there might be a war because there's always war it's unavoidable and Will they, won't they, as far as getting together, which, come on, there, it's leeway is going to win in the end, but. <laughs> I don't know. You never know, because um, the captain definitely still loves her, and he's like, I will be there. I, I genuinely think his love for her was an accident. Like, at first, it started as a way to get where he needed to go, um, and then turned into more for him, and he was like. I got my goals and I got the things I need to do, but also, like, I like her. If Winshaw is in book two, I am sure that will be a conflict that comes up. But there's no way, the way this book has been written so far, that she does not end up with Lee Wei. It's just too much. It's just meant to be. Maybe she, but I could maybe be she goes sideways. There is a dark side of the moon. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Just saying. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I am. Cu- I, I'm sure that it was written with a duology in mind. I'm guessing she presented it that way, but that's a total guess. I have no ground to stand on for that. But it seems like she wanted to tell a very specific story. So, 
Or, or she wrote one book and was like, if I get picked up for book two, I do want this to be a duology. Mm -hmm. But regardless, I love going into it knowing, because this is, I would describe this as like an epic fantasy journey novel, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I like going into it knowing that there's going to be two books and it's done. It's not like, will they make a sequel? Will it come out in the next 10 years, hopefully? <laughs> You know, is this a Wheel of Time situation where I got to wait half my life for 40 books? So it's good to know that after this November, this story will complete and we can move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like knowing that there is an end in sight and that, yeah, yeah we're not just hoping. Um, so I mean, what did you rate it? I oh, sorry. I was just going to say I'm really excited to see where this goes, because, again, it's not like we have any direction um yeah there's no direction yeah at the end. um so i did give it a four out of five i really enjoyed it it definitely um again it was hard for me to read because i wasn't in a reading mood but it wasn't a hard read if that makes sense i enjoyed the story no it was not i enjoyed the story i enjoyed all the characters i want more um i don't think i would read it again again that's what if i give something five stars it means i will read it again um and I I would recommend it to really most people. It wasn't, um, yeah. It it was it was an epic it story. It was a hero story. Yeah, but it wasn't like a deep fan fantastical cut, like oh, like like serious Lord of the Rings fan or something. It's like this is general, more generalized fantasy, and I think a larger audience can appreciate it. Yeah. Um, although the modern the audience reads most stuff now anyways. But um, one thing I'm wondering is whether or not the moon goddess, now that she has her freedom and she's not hiding any secrets, does she become a main character in the next book? Because she's pretty powerful, it seems like. I would... Like, that'd be cool if it was like daughter, mother, journey. I don't know. But I feel like she's got to be in the second book more now that she's free. I would, I would say at least somewhat. But I think she's also very sad, very, like, she's a homebody. She's, like, you know, not been around people. I don't know that she wants to be. <laughs> They've been really mean to oh, her. But, okay, and I almost forgot, but I'm so glad, slash sad, she got to leave and they got to get some closure on the father yeah. because we find out that he did die. He was immortal, so he couldn't live forever. They... They sort of, they found a site or made a site, like a burial, like an area for yeah, him. Yeah, so the, that was good. the black dragon, after he's got his essence back, is about to fly off. And he goes, oh, by the way, at the corner, because each of the dragons has a sea or a lake or something. Um, and he's like, at the corner of my my body of water. Territory. Yeah, my territory. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's where your father lays. Um, and it's yeah. a mountain covered in white daisies. And so they go with with the prince uh, leeway and get to clean the grave site and get to have some closure. Um, and the, the stipulation to the mother's freedom is that she has to still do her moon duties every night. Yeah. Her moon chores. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I, it's funny. Apparently her job is li literally to make sure like the moon rises and sets when it's supposed to. Yeah. So she stands outside. Like, <laughs> yeah so it's like okay but the moon doesn't rise and set like the world just rotates but it's just funny like this is a mythological world so she must literally make sure the moon rises and sets yeah i think it's because she ha she either stands on the porch or walks through the forest so i think it's like when she's inside the house the lights are off and then she goes outside and the lights are on on the moon i don't know yeah i don't know again one of those things not explained and it's really not important yeah. and it's just her duty and she does it <laughs> um what did you give it i don't think you said i know but oh i didn't but um also four out of five um anything i i will always i feel like this will be like a i don't plan on rereading it ever and that's not a bad thing mm -hmm. um at all it's a great book mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll remember i'm sure you're some now i'll think back on it and in my mind it will read like a mythological tale i'll remember all the little parts and i'll be like oh yeah yeah um so our next book, like we've mentioned a couple times, is Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. Um, I have barely started it. Uh, do you want to say anything about why you chose it, or you want me to read the summary? 
Um, all I will say is, well, I chose it because I know it'll be up my alley, and I say that not knowing what the book is entirely about. I just I I know, I know the blurb. Um, but anyone that, that likes the same things I do has always recommended it to me. They're like, it's just a ridiculous book. Um, the main character's name is Hero Protagonist, yeah. so that should tell you something right there. Um, I, you're going to read um, what is, I assume the same description I have on my notes right now, but I just want people to keep in mind that this was published in 1992, which makes the description very interesting in modern times. The date I see is 2003. I think it's 1992 is what I saw. Oh, well, Amazon says 2003. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's that edition i'm i don't know i i think i went on to his wikipedia i'll look that up later and we can correct that when the episode comes okay. out okay um supposedly again i'm reading from amazon this book coined the term metaverse so yes factual. and that's one thing that i found interesting because people all act like the metaverse is some new thing and it's been around a long time yeah <laughs> so a little summary again i know i just said it three times i'm reading this from amazon I have just started it, so I am I am not in a position to give my own summary. So, in reality, Hero Protagonist delivers pizza for Uncle Enzo's Co- Coso Nostra Pizza, Inc., but in the metaverse, he's a warrior prince, plunging headlong into the enigma of a new computer virus that's striking down hackers everywhere. He races along the neon-lit streets on a search-and-destroy mission for the shadowy virtual villain threatening to bring about Info- Infoacalypse? Infoacalypse. <laughs> Say that five times. Um, Snow Crash is a mind-altering romp through a future America so bizarre, so outrageous, you'll recognize it immediately. And honestly, yeah. that last line, again, I'm 13 pages in. Uh, it's, it, is, it is America, but like super warped um, and in a really creative interesting way um yeah and you you said going in you think this might not be like your style of book which i expected when i picked it um so i'll be curious um to see i feel like you're probably gonna give it three stars you haven't read it yet but (laughs) (laughs) i just feel like that's the direction you're probably gonna go and you're forced to read this four or five hundred page book (laughs) i will say that's that's half the fun of of us doing this is that you know we're pushing each other out of our own comfort zones and we're reading things that we wouldn't normally read and sometimes it's a hit and it's great and sometimes it's like what the hell did you make me read um and so far i don't regret any of it (laughs) no it's it's great and i'm we have um a favorites swap coming up in a few months um and that'll be interesting because we're moving my my pick is more in the like fantasy realm of things um and so we'll have to come up with a better term officially for those because we'll be doing that more than once. Yeah. <laughs> Our favorite swap, <laughs> something or other. Yeah. Um, but I'm excited. I, I started it and I immediately was like, this is not what I would like. I would never pick this up. <laughs> um, but we'll see uh, how it goes. Yeah. When I put this book on the list, I was like, I am for sure getting a DNF text. I am not. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. What if I DNF this? <laughs> I don't hate it yet. (laughs) But I also, I would say, and not to drag this out too long, but I would say even if one of us didn't finish a book, there's nothing wrong with reviewing it by what we know because if we don't like a book and don't finish a book, we still have plenty to say about the book. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's always required of us. Yeah. So. But so far we've done good. We've finished each book we've given each other. So True. Um. But yeah, so I'm very excited to keep reading that um, and see see what we think of it. See what I think of it because I might have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I have tons of thoughts already just based on the description. Um, I have lots of comparisons in mind, like Ready Player One, if it's going in that direction. But uh, that's for next time. So for now, you want to go over closing yeah. things? Yeah. Uh- Please rate and subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. Follow us at Paper Quest Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And leave us a comment and let us know what books you're reading. Um, if there's a book that definitely uh, pushed you out of your comfort zone and what you want to hear us talk about in the future. 
Yes, we have already gotten a a book recommendation that we're going to do probably around fall, Halloween-ish, so keep them coming. Um, Check out the show notes wherever you're listening or watching this for all the links that Jess just mentioned, as well as the $1 Patreon and whatever else we may come up with in the future. Until next time. Bye. Bye. (laughs) Bye.